Thank you very much. And it's a, a, an honor for me to be here with the JNF, uh, an organization I have enormous respect for. I've worked a lot with the JNF in the past, and uh, I know that your work is, of course, hugely appreciated over here in Israel, where I'm speaking to you from now. Um, I did come here on the 9th of October, and I've been here since the 9th of October, um, with the exception of about 10 day period in January when I was in the United States. I was briefing UN defense attaches in New York on this conflict, congressmen in Washington. And then I went to Brussels and briefed uh, U EU members of parliament on the conflict also before returning here. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my impressions of this conflict and where it's going um, and, and a bit about the wider conflict. And then I'm more than happy to take questions. I'm going to try and talk for about 10 minutes and leave about 10 minutes for questions. But I do love the sound of my own voice. So I, I apologize if I go on a little bit longer than 10 minutes. I'll try not to. Um, since I've been here, I, 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 I visited some of the worst places hit on the 7th of October very early on when there were still raw sites with bullet ridden cars lying around the streets, bloodstains. Um, houses completely destroyed, as many of them are now, uh, and, and indeed some corpses still lying around in the streets. Not, I would say, corpses of Israelis, but corpses of some of the terrorists that hadn't been cleared up by that point. Um, I also have travelled extensively in Israel. I've, I've uh, visited a number of military units in the north on the Lebanese border, spoken to commanders and soldiers, same around the Gaza border. Uh, and I've had many meetings with politicians and military leaders, etc., in Israel to try and get the best possible picture I can, which I will do my best to convey to you now. Um, and uh, I, I, I should also add that I spent, um, I've been into Gaza itself a few times since the ground war began, and therefore I've been able to get an, an up close picture of the way the IDF is fighting this war. And I'll try and also explain that to you. Uh, from my perspective. And I, I look at these things, obviously, I'm a very strong supporter of Israel. You've got to, you know, you've got to choose your side, and I've chosen the right side. Um, but I also do try and look at um, the, the, this conflict from an objective professional military point of view. Um, I've been living in the Carlton Hotel since I arrived most of the time in Tel Aviv, which some of you may know. Um, and it's been essentially a refugee camp with refugees from uh, Kiryat Shimona in the north and from Ashkelon in the south, um, who have been well looked after in hotels right the way across Israel, including the Carlton. And my main contribution to, um, to, to the refugees has been to act as a Shabbat Goy, um, operating the elevator sometimes for those people who, who uh, need to use it on Shabbat. So I'm a very profession, proficient. Shabbat Goy, if anyone ever needs one. Um, but but I have got a, I've been to Israel many, many times in my life, and um, I've always had a great affection for Israel and for Israelis. Um, but that's, if anything, it's increased dramatically in my time living right up close with ordinary Israeli people, not just politicians, generals, diplomats, media, etc., which I've been more used to. Um, the war itself, I think, is. Um, has been conducted by the IDF with complete brilliance. I mean, obviously what happened on the 7th of October was an utter disaster, um, which, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering the repercussions or Israel's suffering the repercussions from that now, utter disaster. But despite, in among that disaster, there was some immense bravery that we shouldn't neglect when we think about what happened there. Some incredibly brave people, I've met a large number of them, who took their lives into their own hands and went down to save their fellow Israelis in these various locations around the Gaza border. Um, but since then, as I said, the IDF has fought with, with great brilliance. They've eliminated something like probably 50 or 60 percent, possibly even more, of the Hamas fighting capability, which is around about uh, 10, 15,000 terrorists have been killed by the IDF and a lot more have been wounded. Uh, at least that number has been wounded and incapacitated by their wounds. And, and then a large number have also been taken prisoner. 
So a major hit to the Hamas terrorist organization. Numerous tunnels have been destroyed um, uh, and, and vast quantities of terrorist munitions. The cost has not been without, uh, has not been low. It's been, you know, there's over 200 Israeli soldiers have been killed in this fight. I'm, I'm very sorry to say. Um, and it is a tragedy. Every single Israeli soldier that dies is a great tragedy. Um, but what I would say is if you compare the ratios of deaths, deaths and wounding from each side, Israel is very, very clearly winning this conflict. Um, and, and the IDF, when the war began, knowing the objectives they had, expected there to be far higher Israeli casualty rates in this war than there has been. They were thinking about thousands by this point, not the low hundreds. Uh, and I think that shows the professionalism of the IDF. I've seen it with my own eyes. Um, and I know that, that there are senior commanders, generals from armies around the world, including the US, who have been studying this campaign already. They've been here to learn lessons about how the IDF does it. Another tragedy, of course, is the Palestinian civilian casualties in Gaza. We don't know how many. We do know it's quite a large number. Um, I think the numbers coming out of the Gaza Health Ministry, in other words, Hamas, are probably exaggerated. I don't know how much they exaggerated. But one thing we do know is they don't differentiate between um, civilian casualties and combatant casualties, nor do they differentiate between the people, the civilians that have been unfortunately killed as a result of Israeli military action and the very large number of civilians also that have been killed by Hamas, direct murder, uh, either direct murder by their own by, by Hamas against their own people, or indeed, in some cases, uh, by rockets dropping short. I think something like 13 percent of Hamas rockets have dropped short, and some of them will have killed uh, civilians inside Gaza. But if you look at if you do take roughly what um, the Hamas medical authorities figures are, and you compare them to the Israeli estimates of the number of terrorists they killed. In other words, you subtract the terrorists from the number of civilians killed, then you end up with, uh, contrary to what um, you hear in the media every day of indiscriminate killing, war crimes, deliberate murder of civilians by the IDF, you end up with, some, with, with, with a figure that looks like pretty much the lowest civilian to combatant casualty ratio in any conflict since the Second World War in an urban area. And that is, uh, if, if this is correct, we'll find out in the fullness of time. But if that's correct, it looks like um, uh, it, 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 it kind of, I think it, 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 um, it illustrates, if anything, um, the immense measures that the IDF are going to to minimise civilian casualties. I won't go into all that now, we don't really have time. But, it, but they are impressive and contrary to all the stuff you get in the media. Um, as to how progress is going in this very, very complicated battlefield, and it is probably the most treacherous, difficult, demanding, complex battlefield any army has ever had to fought, fight over because of its urban warfare. It's always very dangerous. It's got this massive tunnel structure underneath. I've been into these tunnels underneath Gaza, and they are incredibly difficult places to fight in. Um, plus, of course, you've got the civilian population to be concerned about, and you've got an, another dimension that's pretty much unknown in modern warfare is a large number of hostages, which also um, have to be taken into account by military operational planners. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the spotlight of the world, uh, media, U UN, human rights organizations, all desperate to show that Israel is committing war crimes. All of this adds to the complexity. And then you must add the fact that Hamas is working to try and get the Israelis to kill as many of their own civilians, as many Gazan civilians as possible, in order to bring down the condemnation of the world against Israel, a very well-known tactic by them. Anyway, the IDF have, have pushed through Gaza from north to south. Um, they've destroyed vast quantities of Hamas, as I've mentioned, and now they're on the cusp of entering Rafah which is going to be the most complex situation they face because of the very, very large number of civilians. The IDF have to go into Rafa. They may not go in immediately because there may be a pause while there's a hostage uh, release program. Possibly, I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. But either way, wh whether there's a pause or not, 
the IDF will have to go into Rafa and destroy the Hamas elements that remain there to come to finish the job. That there's no option apart from that. And certainly the view I get from Israeli uh, military and political leaders is that's what's going to happen. Um, then, uh, of course, before that, it'll be necessary to move civilians, as many civilians as possible, out of that area to reduce civilian deaths. Uh, and the IDF have developed very comp comprehensive plans to achieve that. Afterwards, um, then the IDF will have to take control of the whole of Gaza completely, which will be a long process. There are, there are even now there's an insurgency developing in the north with small groups of Hamas terrorists appearing in places that have been previously cleared. This is all going to have to be dealt with over a long period of time, possibly months, possibly years even to, to, to maintain absolute control over Gaza. But it's not going to be the level of intensity we're dealing with right now. It's going to be a much lower level of intensity, I believe, um, with a permanent IDF presence inside Gaza to prevent the rise again of Hamas or their successors. Um, on top of that, of course, there's got to be some arrangements made to control Gaza from a point of view of reconstruction and um, looking after the people of Gaza, feeding them, getting them water and all that sort of stuff. And that's a, a problem that I don't think is yet even coming close to being solved. But maybe there's a period of chaos between when this uh, intensive level of fighting ends and, and, and a, a pro some kind of proper form of governance is established inside Gaza. Briefly up in the north, um, there's been an intensification of Hezbollah actions. Of course, Hezbollah, like Hamas, Islamic Jihad, are controlled by, well, not controlled necessarily, but are sponsored, supported, and to an extent directed by Iran. Um, that, uh, as I say, is intensifying. The many, most of the population in northern Israel has is been evacuated into central and southern Israel. Um, they can't go home until that problem's dealt with. The idea have done enormous damage to Hezbollah in the north, probably to the extent now where they won't be able to achieve the thing that is feared most, which is a, uh, a, a replication of 7th of October from the north, because they've son done so much destruction to Hezbollah's commando force in the north. And also there are now three combat divisions of the IDF based up in the north to prevent that happening, a very strong defense. Whether there's going to be a conflict there, I don't know. I don't think either Israel wants to initiate a conflict at the moment, nor do I think that Iran or Hezbollah want to initiate a conflict. So it may be that things are suppressed with roughly the current level of military activity, possibly with some kind of diplomatic, at least temporary resolution, which sees elements of Hezbollah pushing up north towards the Litani River. Your guess is as good as mine as to whether that will happen. Um, that, in summary, that's the kind of the two major fronts that we're looking at. Of course, we've got the Houthis from Yemen uh, fire, firing missiles, not only at shipping in the Red Sea, but attempting to fire missiles into Israel. Most of those, none of those missiles have succeeded in their, in their uh, intention, and they've been essentially shot down either by Israel or, in one case, Saudi Arabia and the Americans. Um, so... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't consider that problem to be an immediate threat, a significant threat to Israel as it is to the shipping in the Red Sea. And of course, we also have uh, Iranian controlled proxies in Syria, which have made attempts to attack Israel without great success. Um, final, final two points. One, I think um, it, there's no question of Israel achieving its strategic goal of destroying Hamas as a a terrorist entity that, entity that threatens Israel in Gaza, provided that the US does not lean on Israel too hard to prevent them completing the job. And if they do, then maybe the Israeli leadership will overcome that American pressure. I do understand why we've been hearing more negative noises from the White House recently, which I think is um, primarily because they obviously have to take account. I'm not saying this is a good thing to do because it's dangerous as well. Because they, but they do have to take account, the president has to take account of the elections coming up at the end of the year. And, and his electoral objective is, while supporting Israel, also to keep on side the anti-Israel elements in the US. Um, as I say, it's dangerous, particularly dangerous in terms of incitement of anti-Semitic actions in the US, as it is in the UK with our own leadership and other European countries. But so far, I think the US has been very, very 
strongly supportive of of what Israel has has to do. And the final thing is, I th I've spoken to many IDF soldiers all around Israel, including inside Gaza on the front lines. And I'm not, I'm not, as I mentioned, I'm I'm a goy, but uh, and, and I am immensely proud of those soldiers, those Israeli soldiers. And I think you should be enormously proud of them. You should take immense pride in the courage uh, and the achievements and the professionalism and the humanity of the IDF. And certainly for one, whenever I talk to IDF soldiers, whether it's in the north or the south or anywhere else, I'm immensely inspired by what I see. Anyway, I've spoken too long. I said I'd probably go over the time, but I think we've got about five minutes for questions now. So first of all, uh, Colonel, um, I have to say, I think you're the most distinguished Shabbat Goy I've ever met. So uh, congratulations on that <laughs> honor. Um, but, you know, I've said before, and, and I've heard it before, is that we're, we're fighting uh, two battles, one on the ground and one in the media. And um, you have any, uh, any suggestions for us, for our JNF family, of what we should do to help fight the battle in the media? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously extremely difficult. And we, we, the, the reason that there is such a terrible media situation and political situation outside Israel beyond the, just the media is because since the 1960s, an anti-Israel narrative has been developed, deliberately developed, um, which essentially says that Israel is a legitimate country, it is illegitimately occupying um, areas of, uh, of this territory. It, it has illegal settlements. It's an apartheid state. It's now a genocidal state. Uh, and everything it does, everything, well, first of all, anything that happens to it, including the 7th of October, Israel has it coming. And I've heard many people say that. Uh, and secondly, anything Israel does, whatever it does, it's in the wrong. So. Even if Israel had killed no civilians at all in Gaza, it would still be in the wrong. And you still get the, the amount of um, anti-Israel propaganda that you get today. So it's a very, very tough battle to fight. But all I would say is um, really two things. Uh, anyone who's in any position to, um, to, to either directly counter this propaganda by uh, being a, having a voice in the media, um, or holding events, holding protests, holding rallies, supporting Israel. Uh, I think all of that is good. It's all good. It's not necessarily going to change the narrative totally, um, but it is all useful stuff. I think writing to politicians, petitioning uh, congressmen, local political leaders in the various states, etc. I think all of that helps Israel's cause uh, or help. Sure, sure, it doesn't really help Israel's cause because Israel doesn't need any help, really. But it helps, I think counter the um the anti-semitic action that's taking place or you know contributes to that but i would say above all the people that i think are suffering most and i'm, I'm here in israel not in the us but i think the people that suffer most from this campaign are jewish students at universities um who you know we, we all know what pressures are on them so i would say anything anyone can do to help them to support them in any way i think is a, a, a very good thing so we have one more question that just came in. Do, um, do you have any thoughts on how the IDF can root out Hamas in Rafa with them blending into the population? Well, they're going to have to do it in the way they've been doing it so far, which is to the, the one, one thing I would say is, you know, they, they have been very successful so far. They have killed a lot of Hamas terrorists and captured a lot, and they've done it with okay, it's a terrible number of civilians killed, but with the minimum possible civilian deaths, and they're going to have to carry on doing that. I think it, it, although it's going to be a very tough challenge because of the number of civilians that are there, um, and the challenge includes getting them out, of course, um, but over the course of the campaign so far, the roughly four months or more of the war that's been going on now, the IDF has gained, <coughs> excuse me, the IDF has gained a great deal of intelligence um, from computers, from phone systems, from interrogating prisoners, numerous other sources, electronic sources. And, and that gives them, I think, a much clearer picture of what actually is in Rafa than they had up in the north in Gaza City, in Carl Yunis or 
anywhere else they had to attack. And I think they know, now have a pretty clear idea, for example, of the tunnel network underneath Rafa. And rather than having to hunt for tunnels, now they can pretty much go to where they know the tunnels are uh, and deal with them that way. So I think the, the, the problem is much the same. They're probably going to be significantly aided by much greater intelligence than they had before.